Good evening, I trust you're well over at Potton and it's good to be able to record you a message for this evening's service. Let's begin with a prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you alone are God. You are the first and you are the last and there is no one else like you. Father, we thank you that you are supreme over all things. You are creator of this world and you are our creator as well. Father, we thank you that you know us better than anyone else does. We thank you, Lord, that you know us better than we know ourselves. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who alone knows our thoughts, the intentions of our hearts, our motives. You know the way we think and what we think about. And so, Lord, we thank you this evening that we can put ourselves into your care, trusting in your control and in all that you do. Lord, we do pray for one another that we would be growing more in our love and understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ. We would be spending more time with him, becoming more like him, growing in godliness and Christ-likeness. Father, we pray that through these next weeks and months, you would teach us from the scriptures. You would encourage us and bless us in fellowship with each other. And you would help us to see more of our Saviour. Father, we pray this evening as we study uh, the Bible and try and learn from it, that your Holy Spirit would be at work amongst us, that he would open our, our eyes and our ears, and also the eyes and ears of our hearts as well. Father, we pray that we would hear and believe and trust and obey. So Lord, we do ask that you would change us and shape us through your word tonight. We pray for the work of the church at Potom. We thank you, Lord, that Many restrictions have been lifted and certain works can continue and, and grow. And Father, we thank you for the way you've been with us and helped us in our churches over this past year. Lord, we do pray for the children and for any children's work that will be going on this week. We pray for work with the older ones as well, with those who are lonely, those who are unwell, those who are struggling in whatever ways. Father, we do pray that you would equip the church at Potton to serve you faithfully. And we pray, Lord, for opportunities to reach out in the community with the gospel. Help us to seize those opportunities. Help us to do them not trusting in our own strength, but trusting in the Lord Jesus. And may they be done for your glory, we pray. So be with us now, we ask, and bless your word to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to read from Isaiah in chapter 44. This Sunday evening, I'm speaking uh, in a recorded message to you folks at Potton, but I'm also speaking at Wilsted. And uh, I only discovered about two or three weeks ago uh, that I'd booked myself for Wilsted. I'd totally forgotten. And I, I was a little bit panicked. I thought, what am I going to speak on? And I spoke to some folks at church uh, in, in, on a Zoom meeting and said, what would you like me to speak on? And one person said, well, could you do an overview of Isaiah? Well, Isaiah is 66 chapters, so I said no, because that's not really uh, something I could have done in a couple of weeks. Someone else said, well, just something on Isaiah, something about what we've been reading, because our church reading scheme is going through Isaiah. So I picked Isaiah 44, um, and uh, that was what I was reading at the time, and I, I trust you'll find it a blessing as we go through it. We're going to read from chapter 6 through, sorry, verse 6 to verse 23 of Isaiah 44. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock, I know not any. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. 
Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified and shall be put to shame together. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it go strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and breaks, bakes bread. Also he makes a god and worships it. He makes it in an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also he warms himself and says, aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, deliver me, for you are my god. They know not nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire, I also baked bread on its coals, I roasted meat and have eaten, and shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Remember these things, O Jacob, and Israel, for you are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud, and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth, break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest and every tree in it, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Well, I imagine most of you will know something about Japanese knotweed. I've never had to deal with it myself. I understand it's the world's most invasive species. It crowds out other plants, it can destroy roads, it can even destroy buildings, and it's very expensive to have to deal with. But you know, there is a spiritual danger which is far greater than even Japanese knotweed. If it takes root, it will overrun everything and it can destroy our walk with the Lord. What is it? Well, it's idolatry. Now, of course, years ago in Bible times, idolatry, idols, were statues, weren't they? They were made of wood or stone or metal. Perhaps the people built shrines or put them on pillars and they worshipped these statues. Now, in areas of the world today, millions of people still worship idols. They worship statues. I was reading a book just a few weeks ago about a man who became a Christian. But before that, he was a member of the Brahmin caste in India, and he had whole shrines of idols that he worshipped. He had icons up in the wall that he worshipped. He was an idolater. But, you know, an idol isn't just a statue. An idol can be something that I have or something that you have. Martin Luther said, an idol is anything your heart clings to or relies on more than God. So an idol is anything which keeps us from communion with God, anything that distracts us from the Lord. That is an idol. And of course, none of us are exempt from the lure of idols, are we? Whether we're young or old, 
male or female, rich or poor, a believer or an unbeliever. All of us can be tempted and tricked and deceived by idolatry. John Calvin said, the human heart is a perpetual factory of idols. You can imagine a factory in an assembly line where uh, the, these products are just being churned out and churned out and churned out. That is what our hearts are like, churning out all sorts of things to replace God. Well, in this passage, particularly in Isaiah 44, verses 21 to 23, we're given three instructions to combat idolatry in our own lives. Three very simple instructions to fight against idolatry. We see the first one in verse 21. Remember. Remember. Verse 21 says, remember these things, O Jacob, and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you, you are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I wonder if you've ever tied your hanky in a knot, uh, or ever used a post-it note. I have a colleague at work who covers his laptop in post-it notes. Or maybe you've set an alarm on your phone, or reminder on your phone, what are you doing? Well, your aim is to not forget something important. There's something you really need to remember, so you're taking deliberate action to make sure you can bring it to mind. And that is what God calls us to do here. He says, remember. Now, what should we remember? Well, there are two areas in particular the Lord wants us to remember. The first thing is this. Idols are stupid. Idols are stupid. And Isaiah actually gives us, we read them earlier, several convincing reasons why idols are just stupid. The first one is in verse 10, and that's that idols are useless. The idols of the Old Testament, they couldn't speak. They couldn't move. They couldn't open their eyes. They were just useless blocks of wood. And idols today are equally useless. Some people uh, make gaming an idol, don't they? I know people who every evening they will sit down and play the Xbox for several hours. And perhaps they discuss with others what they've been up to. And day after day after day, they play on the Xbox. They live for their gaming. Now, at the end of the day, when they switch it off and go to bed, what have they got to show for all of that time? Nothing. Maybe a high score, but that doesn't count for much, does it? Their idol is useless. It doesn't gain them anything. But then idols aren't just uh, useless, but they're also expensive, aren't they? In verse 12, we read about this ironsmith, this blacksmith, and he works long and he works hard. He gets tired, he gets hungry, he's faint. It's hard old work making an idol. It's a costly business. They're expensive. And you know, people spend vast sums of money on their idols today, don't they? Apparently a set of three tickets for the Euro finals sold on eBay for £22,000. Now, there's no justification for spending £22,000 on football tickets, is there? It's an idol. It's idolatry. Idols are expensive. And then in verses 16 and 17, Isaiah shows us that not only are idols stupid because they're useless, not only are idols stupid because they're expensive, but they're also stupid because they're made from leftovers. You see that a carpenter cuts down a tree with part of it. He, he makes a fire and he cooks his food and he keeps himself warm. And then with the leftover, he makes it into an idol. He makes it into a god and he worships it. Now, that is just stupid, isn't it? Idols are made of leftovers. 
do you realize that the latest iPhone is made of 98% recycled materials? That means that one day someone drinks out of a can and they throw it in the bin. The next day that can is remade into a smartphone for someone to worship. Do you see the point? Idols are made from leftovers. And that is stupid, isn't it? To worship something that's a leftover, to worship something that's so expensive, to worship something that's so useless. Idolatry is just plain stupid. And that's the first thing that Isaiah wants us to remember. But then there's another thing he wants us to remember. And that's that while idols might be stupid, God is supreme. Look at verse 21. I formed you. You are my servant. Now that phrase formed you has the idea of a potter squeezing the clay into shape. Now I've not done pottery for a long while and I was never much good at it. Uh, but, but a potter, what they're doing is they're making an object with a purpose, aren't they? They might be making a jug or a bowl or a sculpture for people to look at. But, you know, that bowl can't one day wake up and decide that it doesn't want to be a bowl anymore. Can't do that, can it? It was made with a purpose and it must do the job that the potter designed it for. Now, the Lord is our creator. He formed us. He made us with a purpose. And that purpose is to bring honour and glory to his name. When we follow idols, we're ignoring the purpose for which we were made. The second part of that verse, God says, you are my servant. Now, a servant is employed for a particular job, aren't they? They have a job description, uh, they apply for that job, and that's their role. That is the, their terms of employment. A cook can't one day decide that she's going to go out for a walk instead of making the dinner. She can't do that. She has a job to do, and she's under the authority of her employer. At least if she does do that, she won't keep her job for long, will she? And in a similar way, we are under the authority of God. We're his servants. We're created with a purpose and we're under his authority. So we shouldn't be frittering away our lives on idols. We have a purpose. We have a boss. He is supreme. We should be spending our lives as he sees fit. Now, we live in a world that values freedom, don't we? Uh, just this past Monday was so-called Freedom Day. I don't know what you feel about Freedom Day, but uh, um, it wasn't really a Freedom Day as such, was it? But people value freedom. And to the unbeliever, this concept of the Lord being supreme might seem oppressive. It might seem that he's, he's a dictator that he's exerting his power over us wrongfully. But actually, the Christian has an intimacy and a closeness with God, which is just beyond imagination, isn't it? He's not oppressed. He's a friend. He's a member of the family, as it were. And that relationship can never be had with an idol. You can think of pop stars or um, uh, film stars who... Who, who love the fame and the popularity. But they just have to keep feeding it, don't they? And the day will come when fame and popularity is fickle and it leaves them behind. They can never have that intimacy and closeness that the Christian has with his God. In verse 21, he says, O oh Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. A few weeks ago, I spoke at a church and um, the pastor introduced me to his wife and I said, oh, yes, we've met before. And she looked at me totally blankly. Now, I don't blame her. There's not much uh, about me that might, perhaps uh, needs remembering. Uh, but people forget us, don't they? 
But God is supreme. He never forgets his people. So there are two things which God calls us to remember. Firstly, idols are stupid. Secondly, God is supreme. So our first instruction to combat idolatry is to remember. The second instruction is in verse 22, and it's to return. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Now, after showing up idolatry for what it is, the Lord now commands us to leave it behind and to return to him. And did you notice that he doesn't tell us to return to a life of strict law keeping? He doesn't tell us to return to just a religious lifestyle. He doesn't even tell us to return to a, a, a regime of penance. No, he tells us to return to him. We're to return to the living God, to a rich living relationship with that God. What does returning to God entail? When it means we spend time with him again. It means we delight ourselves in him and who he is. We immerse ourselves in his words. We meditate on his character. We spend time with his people. That's what returning to God is about. My eldest daughter Esther used to love riding her scooter. But then a while back we bought her a new bike. And she loved that even more. And the scooter was abandoned. It was cast away. It was left at the end of the garden for my middle child to find and enjoy. You see, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, our old idols will soon lose their luster and their attraction. We'll be so taken in with, with, with the Lord and our relationship with him that we can forget about the old things. We can forget about those idols because God is so much better. There's that hymn which says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Did you see the motive that God gives us for returning? He says, return to me, for I have redeemed you. That word redeemed has the idea of spending a great cost to get something back. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross, didn't he? He spent a great cost, his own body, his own blood broken and shed on that cross. He was separated from his father. All of our sins were laid upon him. He bore the brunt of that penalty. So that our sins could be forgiven. So that we could be brought back into a relationship with God. Our idolatry is pictured in this verse as a cloud, as mist. It's something which obscures our view. It's something which cuts us off from God and it leaves us in danger because God is the life giver and we're separated from that life. We cannot access his mercy. We cannot access his grace. We cannot wonder and marvel in his beauty. He's hidden behind a cloud, the cloud of our sin. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we were on holiday in the highlands of Scotland. And we decided to drive up Applecross Pass. Uh, it does have a Gaelic name, but I can't pronounce it. So I'll call it Applecross Pass. And it's the steepest road in Scotland. And the road winds up through this valley and up the mountainside to the top. where We've got these amazing views. And then it goes back down the other side for several miles. And it's a single track road with a few passing places. And this time of year, there's lots of motorhomes going up and down it. There's lots of um, um, big motorbikes, touring bikes going up and down it as well. It's quite busy. 
Well, we drove up this pass and we got near the top and all of a sudden we drove into a thick cloud and we couldn't see a thing. We could only see about two car lengths ahead of us. And remember, it was a single track road. There could be cars coming towards us, cars up behind us. We couldn't see. We were hidden. It was quite dangerous. It was dark. We couldn't see what was going on. But when we went down the other side, we went to the beach. And when we'd finished at the beach, we went back over the pass. And by the time we went back, the wind had blown the clouds away. And I looked out the window and I said to Jackie, where was all of this when we drove the other way? It's beautiful. We could see locks, we could see hills, we could see the, the, the beautiful sky. There was so much we could see that we'd missed before. And it no longer felt dangerous because we could see cars coming in the distance and we had time to pull over and let them pass. The wind had blown away the cloud and everything was so much better. Do you know, we're told that God had bl has blotted out our transgressions like a cloud. The cloud was there, hiding him, that cloud of sin, but he's blown it away. He's wiped it out. He's blotted it out. He's removed it entirely so that now we can come to God. We can see the beauty of God. We can enjoy him. We have the safety of his mercy and his grace. That sin has gone. And, you know, when we grasp the great cost of our salvation, when we grasp the significance of our salvation, we should be motivated to abandon our idols, to destroy them, to forget about them, to reject them. And instead to return to God. So the first command we had to combat idolatry was to remember. And the second command we have here is to return, to return to God. But there's a third command we're given, a third way that we can combat idolatry in our lives. And it's in verse 23. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. The third thing we should be doing is rejoicing. Rejoicing. Have you ever seen a mountain sing or a tree shout? Well, unless you're an avid Disney fan, I don't think you will have done. And I have not either. But the picture in this verse is of a, of a creation that is so filled with rejoicing that it just wants to burst forth into song. Did you see the flow of the verse? It begins in the heavens. It moves down to the earth, then to the mountains, then to the forests, and finally to the trees, the individual trees. Rejoicing begins at the top, but even the most humblest part is involved. And you know, you and I are part of this creation choir as well. What should we be rejoicing about? Well, we should be rejoicing in the great work that God has done. And we're told in our verse that he's redeemed his people and he has glorified himself. What does it mean when it says that the Lord has glorified himself? Well, his work of salvation has demonstrated the glory of his character to the world. His work of salvation has demonstrated the glory of his character to the whole world. So what can we see in salvation that brings glory to God? Well, we can see his mercy, can't we? He doesn't punish us as we deserve. And then we see his grace. He gives us blessings that we don't deserve. We see his justice. He cannot simply ignore sin. We see his patience. He gives us time to repent. We see his love. He willingly gave his only begotten son to die for us. That's sacrificial love, isn't it? And then we see his power. 
how he takes sinners and he transforms them into saints. So the Lord has covered himself in glory through salvation. He has demonstrated that glory to the world. And, you know, God won't be satisfied with sharing that glory. With an idol. Look at verse eight in the second part. He says, you are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. When we rejoice, we are witnesses to the fact that God is the only God. We are witnesses to his power and glory, but we're also witnesses to the uniqueness of who he is. So we should sing. We should shout. We should make people aware of what God is like. There's a story of a lady who was in a London train station. And a man stopped her and said, excuse me, madam, I need to thank you. She said, what do you mean? Why, why do you need to thank me? He said, well, I used to be a ticket collector. And every single day you'd pass, uh, pass by me and uh, I'd let you through the gate and you'd smile at me. Whether it be rain or shine, you'd smile and you'd say thank you and you'd be friendly. And he said, I used to wonder where you got your smile from. He said, then one day I saw you walk through my gate carrying a Bible. And I thought, well, perhaps that's where she gets her smile from. So I went home, I found a Bible and I started to read it. And now I have found Christ and I can smile too. Isn't that a lovely story? When we rejoice in Christ. When our life is one of joy and happiness because of Christ and what he has done, then that is a witness to God. You know, those who trust in idols have no reason to be happy. They have no reason to rejoice. In fact, our passage in Isaiah tells us that they will one day be filled with shame. They'll be ashamed of what they've done. But rejoicing, whatever the weather is an evidence that you know the Lord and that God is at work in your life. So we've thought about three things we need to do to combat idolatry. We need to remember. What do we need to remember? Well, the stupidity of idols and the supremacy of Christ. We've thought how we need to return. Each one of us needs to return unto God, to abandon our idolatry and to come back to him. And we've thought that we need to rejoice. Our life should be one of praise and happiness and proclaiming what God has done for us. I think really the danger and the stupidity of idolatry is summed up in verse 20. He feeds on ashes. Imagine you went into a restaurant and saw someone surrounded by delicious food. But instead of touching the roast lamb or the salmon or the burgers or the curry or all the other lovely things, they were sitting with a plate of ashes and a spoon eating up those ashes. You know, that is what idolatry is like. It's the rejecting of something wonderful and glorious and fantastic and replacing it with something dead and dry and tasteless and useless. Are you feeding on ashes? Are you feeding on ashes? Are you chasing after idols when you should be chasing after God? Well, if we're honest, all of us, to a certain extent, have to say yes. All of us exchange those wonderful foods for a plate of ashes at times. But the good news for me and the good news for you is that God calls us to return to him. And if we do, 
If we repent of our idolatry and turn back to him, he is gracious, he is merciful, he forgives us and he blows away those clouds of sin so that our relationship with him can be restored. So folks, can I encourage you this evening to abandon idolatry and to turn back to the living God who is better in every single way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, teach us that idolatry is like ashes. Teach us that the things we love and cherish in our lives, which we shouldn't be, are dead and dry and useless. Father, we pray that you would bring us back to you. Help us to return to you, we pray. Help us to delight ourselves in the Lord Jesus. Help us to immerse ourselves in him. And Father, we pray that as we do so, the things of this world would grow strangely dim. So, Father, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for how real and how truthful they are. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to put them into practice in this coming week. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, folks, for listening. It's been good to be able to share this with you. And God bless you in the weeks coming forward.